Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Today we got some more actual history for you from this book right here, Border Wars of Texas by James T. DeShields. This is an authentic and popular account in chronological order of the long and bitter conflict waged between the Indian tribes and the pioneer settlers of Texas. Now this story today is another one about the ongoing battle between Stephen F. Austin's colony and the Karankawa Indians. It's called the Famous Canoe Fight. About this time, around 1823, Captain White, an old trader who lived at Labahia and owned a small boat, had an adventure with the Karankawas. Embarking at Port Lavaca, his vessel, loaded with salt to exchange for corn, he steered up the Colorado to what is called Old Landing, two miles from its mouth where he landed, leaving his boat in charge of two or three Mexicans and went up to the settlement in search of corn. A party of Karankawas were encamped near the landing, and professing friendship for White and his Mexican companions, requested him to visit them on his return as they wished to trade for corn. Going up Peach Creek to the Kinchalo settlement, White found corn in exchange for his salt, the corn to be delivered to his boat and the salt received there. Meantime, the settlers were informed of the situation, and a runner sent 60 miles above for Captain Jesse Burnham, who hastily collected a company of 25 men and marched on the Indians. We quote Burnham's own account. White was to inform the Indians of his return by making a campfire. He gave the signal just at daylight. I left 12 of my men at the boat for fear the Indians might come from a different direction, while I took the other half and went down the river to the Indians' landing place. About half an hour by sun, the Indians came rowing up the river, very slowly and cautiously as though they expected danger. The river banks were low, but with sufficient brush to conceal us. Just as they were landing, I fired on them. My sign shot, killing one Indian, and in less than five minutes we had killed eight. The other two swam off with the canoe, which they kept between them and us. But finally, one of them, raising his head to guide the canoe, received a mortal shot. I returned home without the loss of a man. Through favorable reports sent out by Austin, his colony continued to increase in population giving a semblance of strength that would better enable him to cope with the Indians. The land office was open, surveyors appointed, and we are informed about 250 titles were issued to the original 300 settlers during this year. While the colonists busied themselves selecting locations, surveying lands, and making improvements, tidings came that a small party of immigrants en route from the mouth of the Brazos River had been attacked and murdered by the exasperated Karankawas. Colonel Austin, to retaliate and prevent a repetition of such outrages in September, commissioned Captain Randall Jones with a company of 23 men to proceed down the Brazos River in canoes, reconnoiter the coast as far as Matagorda Bay, and if found, show no mercy to the party that massacred the emigrants, as well as any other hostile Indians. Landing at a favorable position, scouts were sent out to reconnoiter. We quote from Jones's journal, Convinced that the Indians were secretly preparing for an attack, two of the scouts were dispatched up the river for reinforcements. At Bailey's store on the Brazos, they were joined by eight or ten colonists, already collected to watch the maneuverings of about a dozen Indians who had visited that place for ammunition. At daybreak the following morning, an attack was made. A few Indians were killed, and their discomfited companions routed. In the meantime, directed by the loud wailing for their fallen comrades at Bailey's, Captain Jones ascertained that some 30 Indians were encamped on the west bank of a small, sluggish tributary of the San Bernard, since called Jones Creek. Approaching under cover of night within 60 yards of the encampment, the company halted, quickly prepared for action, and when it was light enough to see their sights, made a furious attack. Although greatly surprised, the Indians quickly hid themselves in the reeds and tall marsh grass where they fought with great desperation and advantage. Exposed to the deadly balls and arrows of the Indians, the whites finally retreated with the loss of three of their number, Spencer, Bailey, and Singer. The Indians, too, suffered severely, their dead being estimated at 15, 
A proportionate number were wounded on either side. John Henry Brown says it was a clear repulse of the whites, whose leader, Captain Jones, was an experienced soldier of approved courage. Such a result was lamentable at that period in the colony's existence. The whites returned home and the Indians retreated westward across the San Bernard River. Greatly incensed and somewhat emboldened, the Caroncoas now became more hostile and troublesome than ever. So that's the end of this story. As you can see here, it appears by this time that Stephen F. Austin's colonists had developed a policy of no mercy towards the Karankawa Indians after some depredations and battles that had occurred between the two groups before then. So if you want to hear more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.